Thank you, Richard. And I'd like to thank AAKP for inviting me to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about infections, which is something that CDC cares quite a lot about, of course. And also, uh, we've learned over the years that this is a topic that's really important to patients, um, that they care about infections and that infections are something that can impact their quality of life and also make it harder for them to go on to get a successful transplant. So um, I'm going to try to quickly run through some of these topics. I'll give you some background on infections and dialysis patients that many of you probably already know, but I can help to, I think, put some numbers in context. Um, I'll talk about some efforts being made by CDC's Making Dialysis Safer for Patients Coalition to try to address the problem. Um, some of the things that are being done around patient engagement when it comes to infection prevention, and then also my thoughts on the need for innovation when it comes to infection prevention. So I think all of you, or at least many of you, know that dialysis patients are immune compromised as a result of their kidney disease. Um, they are also at increased risk of infections because of their frequent encounters with healthcare. That's in the dialysis center, that's also during hospitalizations and for surgeries, all of which they have quite frequently. And each of these represents an opportunity for them to acquire an infection um, related to their healthcare. Of course, hemodialysis patients require some sort of access to their bloodstream infection, and this can serve as a pathway for the introduction of pathogens into the bloodstream and cause infection. As I think all of you know, patients also routinely undergo outpatient treatment in a shared patient care environment, which might be good for some things like socialization, uh, but really isn't good when it comes to uh, preventing spread of pathogens from one person to another. So this is one of the challenges that we face. Another thing that's sort of a reality of outpatient dialysis is that the frontline staff who have uh, most of the direct patient contact with these patients really have no formal education or training in healthcare. Um, and this is yet another challenge when we're trying to um, ensure that all of the best evidence-based infection prevention techniques are being practiced on uh, a regular basis in these settings. We know that infections are a leading cause of death and hospitalization for dialysis patients. Antibiotics and antibiotic resistance are obviously important topics for CDC and also HHS in general. And we know that uh, if you look at just a one-year time period, roughly 30 to 40 percent of dialysis patients will receive at least one course of antibiotics during that time. Uh, so it's not unusual for up to a third of dialysis patients to be at risk for getting an antibiotic resistant um, infection or being colonized by a pathogen that is resistant to antibiotics. If we look at just one um, specific um, multi-drug resistant organism that CDC conducts surveillance for, this is methicillin resistant Staph aureus or MRSA infections, the incidence of invasive MRSA infections in dialysis patients is several hundred times greater than in the general population. Hepatitis C is another challenge that we deal with quite frequently, unfortunately, in dialysis settings and in dialysis patient populations. So the prevalence of hepatitis C in dialysis patients is roughly 10 to 14 percent in the United States, and that's compared to 1.3 percent in the general patient population, or excuse me, the general population. And of all of the healthcare-related hepatitis C outbreaks that are reported to CDC, 57% of them occur in hemodialysis clinics. So let me just restate that again. Of any kind of healthcare-related outbreak of hepatitis C in any type of healthcare settings, and there are lots of them, including formal healthcare settings and informal sort of makeshift healthcare settings, uh, the most common setting for hepatitis C outbreaks that we see is hemodialysis clinics. Bloodstream infections, um, as I mentioned, is something that dialysis patients are susceptible to by virtue of having to have access to their bloodstream. So there were 29,500 bloodstream infections uh, in outpatient hemodialysis patients reported to CDC's National Healthcare Safety Network, which is a national surveillance system for healthcare associated infections. Um, this is uh, the number of infections that were reported in 2014. Close to half of those, or 48%, resulted in a hospitalization. Roughly three quarters, or 76%, were considered to be related to the vascular access, and 70% of those occurred in patients with a catheter. So for those of you who are clinicians and nephrologists, I don't think any of this information is going to be surprising to you, but um, it is, um, it's impressive the number of uh, infections that there are that occur in this patient population, the extent to which they impact uh, morbidity and mortality, and how much they um, how much they affect the uh, patient's quality of life. So central line associated bloodstream infections, which are essentially bloodstream infections that can be uh, attributed or related back to a uh, patient's catheter, um, are substantial for a number of reasons. We have 
uh, the best data on uh, mortality, cost, and other outcomes related to these. And so the attributable mortality for these infections is very high. There's substantial cost. And importantly, the estimated number of central line associated bloodstream infections, or CLABSIs, in all hemodialysis outpatients is comparable to the total number of CLABSIs in all US hospital inpatients. The reason that this is important is that for many, many years, probably close to a decade, there's been extreme um, efforts and investments made in preventing CLABSIs in inpatients in hospitals. Uh, I don't think there's been the same degree of investment or effort focused on high-risk outpatient populations such as hemodialysis patients. Again, I think um, a lot of this is information that is very familiar to nephrologists and clinicians, but um, patients who have a catheter are in the minority when it comes to all patients, um, uh, all hemodialysis patients, and yet their risk is much higher of getting an infection than uh, say, a patient who has an AB fistula or a graft. So the bloodstream infection risk for a catheter patient is roughly eight times the risk in an AB fistula patient. And there's uh, multiple guidelines that recommend use of AB fistulas or grafts instead of catheters for patients who are on hemodialysis. And thanks to the Fistula First initiative and I think other efforts, there has been a decline in catheter use among prevalent hemodialysis patients. And that number is currently around 20%. So roughly 20% of all hemodialysis patients will have a catheter. Uh, but where we need a lot more work is in patients who start hemodialysis. And this was alluded to by other presenters earlier today. Um, so upon hemodialysis initiation, that number has been relatively stable. Roughly 80% of um, hemodialysis patients will actually start with a catheter. Um, and even 90 days after initiating hemodialysis, roughly 70% of hemodialysis patients still have a catheter in place. So catheter use among new hemodialysis patients remains high. And um, dialysis providers really feel like this is outside of their realm of control. They don't feel like there's much that they can do about this. And so this is an area where I really think that innovative approaches that are targeted towards hospitals, hospital-based providers, and healthcare systems should really be considered. We'll talk more about that when I get to my wish list for innovations. So um, that was a lot about the problem, and now I'd like to talk about at least one way in which we're trying to achieve a solution, and that's the Making Dialysis Safer for Patients Coalition. This is um, a coalition that's a collaboration of diverse organizations and individuals, including AAKP, who joined forces with the common goal of promoting the use of CDC's recommended <coughs> interventions and resources to prevent bloodstream infections in dialysis patients. So without going into all of the data, I'll give you the high level version of this. We work together with a small number of motivated dialysis centers who all work together to um, implement evidence-based recommendations for preventing infections, and they were able to show that they could have a significant impact and reduce the infections in their facilities and actually be able to sustain those lowered infection rates in their facilities by following evidence-based practices. So in the work leading up to the coalition, we learned that bloodstream infections in dialysis patients are actually preventable, and that's something that we didn't know before we started. There's actually a lot that providers can do, um, including things like improving catheter care that can make a difference in the lives of patients. Um, we learned that improved infection rates can occur relatively rapidly after initiating some of these evidence-based practices and adhering to them and can be sustained for a prolonged period of time. And there are important secondary benefits for patients, such as reduced hospitalizations and reduced um, IV antibiotic use. So for uh, many years, we've been focused on getting providers to actually adopt our recommended practices. We've created many tools and resources to facilitate implementation, such as this one. This is um, a list of what we call our core interventions. These are the evidence-based practices that that group of facilities that I just mentioned implemented in their facilities and were able to show had an impact on reducing rates. And I'm sorry that you know you can't read this, uh, but it's on our website, and I'd be happy to share with you what these are if you'd like. Um, we know prevention is possible, we know how to do it, and we've created all sorts of tools to help with the implementation of those core interventions that we now recommend every dialysis center um, be, be using in their facilities. So again, much of our focus historically has been on the frontline providers, getting them to actually implement checklists and other tools to do procedures right every single time. So every single time they're gonna connect or disconnect a catheter, they gotta do it the right way and hopefully follow that checklist. 
with a coalition that has allowed us to sort of take a broader approach and think um, more broadly about who else and what else influences what happens at that chair side in that interaction between the provider and the patient. And of course, there's lots of these stakeholders that we're very interested in bringing to the table and patients and family members are, are certainly um, first and foremost on that list. So these are the goals of the coalition. The goals are to facilitate implementation and adoption of our core interventions through various means, increase awareness about the interventions and share experiences and findings through collaboration with other coalition participants. I'm happy to say that at this point, our um, participation has increased to, um, it's been updated since then. There's actually 66 organizational partners that are part of the coalition. They include uh, many of the largest dialysis provider organizations, professional organizations, patient organizations such as AKP, ESRD networks. Um, we have a large number of health departments and also federal agencies. We also have a category of individual membership, and we have more than 1,300 individual members who are part of um, who are part of the coalition now. So I know nobody can really read that, but there's a large number of dialysis provider organizations, health departments, and others that we're we're um, proud to be able to collaborate with. So when an organization approaches us and says that they want to be part of the coalition, we ask them to submit a letter of commitment that outlines what they're going to do in these different um, categories of activities. So how are they going to implement CDC recommendations? How will they generate awareness? How will they educate their staff? And how will they share experiences and findings? Next, I'd like to talk about patient engagement, which is connected to what we do in the coalition. So um, unfortunately, there's not a lot in the scientific literature on patient opinions, perspectives, and engagement in the topic of infection prevention. This is one um, article that I wanted to just share some highlights um, from with you. This is a workshop that was done with eight patients and three caregivers. It was conducted in Australia, and they asked patients, these were dialysis patients and caregivers, they asked them to identify topics of importance for inclusion in a clinical practice guideline on the topic of infections in hemodialysis units. So here are some highlights. The participants said that the guidelines should include that all hemodialysis patients should be educated about infectious organisms, including transmission and impact of infection for future treatment. And here when they say future treatment, they're talking about future treatment of their CKD. Patients have a fear of infection. That's something that they um, uh, reported in this article. They are fearful of not only acquiring infection, but also um, have a fear of spreading infection to other patients. They commented on the lack of respect for privacy and confidentiality, and it was interesting that even in Australia, the model of uh, dialysis centers is really the same. So there was comment about the, the fact that in this open unit, providers were talking to them about potentially sensitive or confidential information. Um, and they thought that guidelines should advise upon the manner in which sensitive information is communicated in this group setting. And there was confusion about procedural inconsistencies, which I think will be um, demonstrated a little bit more clearly with these quotes. So a couple of quotes from this article. Participants felt that patients should be included in prevention and control efforts. For example, one participant stated, patients come up with really good ideas. Instead of you telling people what to do to prevent transmission, sometimes they should be telling you. And that's certainly something that we've learned over the past year or so. Patients also remarked that the focus on cleanliness and hygiene was not always clear to them. For example, while the importance of hand washing was emphasized to patients, they observed that surfaces and equipment may not be routinely wiped down. So this is what um, they were referring to in terms of procedural inconsistencies, that what is communicated to and expected from patients is different than the expectations of staff in that same uh, setting. We recently had a conversation with patients and caregivers at AKP's national patient meeting. Uh, there were uh, a total of eight participants, two of them were caretakers, and we asked questions such as, what does it mean to be a patient advocate? Have you ever seen something at your dialysis center that could put a patient at risk for an infection? How do you speak up? Why wouldn't you speak up? And what is the one thing about infection that you think patients need to hear from another patient? So here are some of the highlights from the feedback that we got um, at this meeting. So very few patients actually considered themselves, uh, patients or caregivers actually considered themselves advocates. However, they defined advocacy as a see something, say something mentality, not just for oneself, but for others as well. And uh, a few uh, participants mentioned that uh, being a patient advocate gave them a sense of purpose, particularly after they had lost their um, profession when transitioning to dialysis. <clears throat> 
Unfortunately, all participants had seen things that could put patients at risk for infection in their dialysis units, such as blood on the dialysis chair or the walls, staff using their sleeves to touch the machine to avoid hand hygiene. It was actually quite impressive, the, um, the rapid list of examples that patients could come up with when we asked this question. And they mentioned that it's not always easy to speak up, and there are many reasons for this. Um, first and foremost was the fear of retribution, not wanting to correct doctors, and not necessarily being positive of the right way a particular procedure should be done. However, they wanted to learn the right way. Um, as a physician, I've been in situations, and I'm sure many of you have as well, if you're actually in a healthcare encounter and it's not your home hospital or it's not your home clinic, and you're either the patient or you're there with a family member, I have found it difficult to speak up for myself or my family member. And so I feel like this is a huge climb that we're trying to do here, um, but it's incredibly important. And of course, they said that hearing stories from other patients can be very impactful and very meaningful and much more meaningful than hearing those uh, messages from others. So we have a patient engagement work group in our coalition, and I just wanted to share with you our aim statement, which is to facilitate patients becoming infection prevention advocates, focusing on the staff-patient interaction and peer mentorship. And we've certainly learned that we can't expect patient engagement to occur if we're just focusing on the patient. It has to be a focus on the partnership between the staff and the patient such that the staff are inviting patients to be involved and engaged. We also have a catheter care work group and one of our aims is uh, very much related to patient engagement and that is changing the dialysis setting culture and empowering patients to care for their catheters in the home. So I think a, a couple of people have alluded to the fact that with home care, whether it's peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis, that there's much more patient education and patient empowerment going on. And there's no reason why that can't also happen for patients who receive in-center hemodialysis. But of course, it requires a major culture shift. So if any of you are old school like me, you might recognize this figure. Um, I don't know if you can actually see it if you're old school like me, but this is where we are now, in my opinion. We're at the bottom of this um, hill trying to climb up. And, and at the top of the hill is where we really want to be with fully engaged patients and family members and a culture that really encourages their engagement. So we, we have some work to do, and I look forward to hearing, of, hearing from people about how we can get there. So lastly, I just wanted to say, um, in dialysis, have we come a long way? Uh, I'm not so sure. I would argue that the technological advances, at least that you see in this beautiful dialysis center here, are more um, in terms of the nice um, flat panel TV screens that are available for, for patients and the nice laptop that they have available. But in terms of how the dialysis is actually done and the dialysis that um, the procedure that's uh, performed, I don't think very much has changed over time. Another thing that I've uh, mentioned on, on several times in this presentation is that while this is a very pretty dialysis center from an infection control standpoint, it is a major challenge. We've got, again, a very convenient situation where staff can move very quickly between one patient to another, which makes it um, convenient for them, but it also makes it very difficult to prevent the spread of pathogens from one patient to another, and that's a major challenge that we deal with. So we would love to see some innovations in that area. Here's my wish list um, for innovations if um, I had my way. Uh, number one, I mentioned that we uh, really are in need of strategies to address the high catheter usage among the new hemodialysis patients, and that could be in the form of incentives or policy levers uh, that are directed towards hospital-based providers and healthcare systems, not so much the dialysis providers. Um, I, I think we absolutely need uh, improved dialysis facility design and workflow. This is probably one of the last healthcare settings that is uh, where healthcare is provided in this form that looks like a TB ward that some of you may recall from 1950s. In no other healthcare setting is healthcare provided in this kind of uh, shared group setting uh, from the standpoint of privacy, confidentiality, and also infection prevention, uh, it creates challenges. Uh, I think we're very, very behind when it comes to infection prevention technologies and advances, and I'd love to see more uh, innovations in that area, and also more participation in collaborative research. So obviously, the purpose of research is to create generalizable knowledge and to disseminate that knowledge, and I don't really see that happening when it comes to infection prevention, patient safety, quality improvement. Um, and then lastly, I would ask that for everybody who's thinking about technological advances when it comes to dialysis, machines, dialyzers, water systems, any of the above, that uh, you give 
uh, consideration to infection prevention um, uh, aspects of those technological advances. And so I think that um, I I'm excited by all of the advances that are occurring. And I think sometimes infection prevention, um, how would you, for example, disinfect a new machine is sort of the last thing that people think about. Um, and then lastly, I don't know if this is uh, really appropriate to put in the category of innovation, but um, bringing it back to patient engagement. Um, I, as I mentioned, I think that we have a large hill to climb in that, and I would love to to see more innovation around how you actually get um, this patient population that overall is not particularly engaged and is very fearful how you get them more engaged in their own care. So with that, I will um, end and thank you very much for your attention.